Now, my guest this week was telling me that the Stage newspaper had a, a poll for the top ten dames of all time in pantomimes. And who was number one? Don McLean. Oh, yeah, I'm very proud. I'm very proud of that, Des. Thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk life stories here. Go on, then. Born in Birmingham. Yeah. That's when... something... Uh, one of the greatest things in life. I, the two greatest things in life, I think, are to be born a Brummie and to be born a Roman Catholic. And uh, I, I, I qualify on both of those. <laughs> <laughs> and you went to school at uh, Bolsall Heath, was it? Yeah, I, I lived in S uh, Sparkbrook, where I actually lived, Ombersley Road, and the bottom half of Ombersley Road was Sparkbrook. Uh, but I went to um, uh, Clifton Road School in, in Bolsall Heath until I was 11. And then, when you left school, you worked for the Inland Revenue. Ooh. I did, I did. I left, uh, I left grammar school at the age of 16 with uh, seven O-levels, one A-level, two spirit levels and a girl's bike <laughs> and um, launched myself <laughs> on the unsuspecting British public uh, training to be a tax inspector. Uh, I don't know why, I, you know, if you'd got more than five O-levels, the thing to do was sort of to go into the civil service in those days. I'm talking about 1960 it was. Yeah. Uh, and so off I went, um, and, uh, and I hated it. I really, really hated it. I mean, it was like, I suppose, when I left school, a bank was a job for life, you know, yeah. you, you, that was what you aimed for, wasn't it? Yeah, and I suppose a bank was probably as boring as being yeah. a civil servant. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and people say, oh, civil servants, they just sit around drinking tea all day. No, they don't. Mm. I mean, the workload we had was ridiculous, and yeah. you were always behind with your work because they were piling so much onto you, you know. So, so what, what got you into the comedy then? Where, where did that come from? Um, well, I, I, I always performed. My, my mother was um, a very fine amateur pianist. And when I was a little lad, I'm talking about before, I was an only child, before I went to school, you know, so under five, uh, every morning she used to play the piano, because mums didn't go to work in those days. Mm -hmm. She used to play the piano and she taught me to sing. And when we went to places, you know, when we went on holiday, they'd, they'd always say, can anybody play the piano? And mum would get up and I'd stand beside her at the piano and, and sing and we'd both have free drinks all night, you know, which was great. <laughs> and uh, by the time, when I went to school, when I was five, I'd got a repertoire of about 30 songs. So the teachers thought, hang on, we've got a kid here. I'm not saying I could sing well, but could sing in tune. Yeah. And then the first Christmas I was at school, Gene Autry brought out Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer on record. Ooh. My mother taught me the song. So yeah. that uh, Christmas I was taken around from classroom to classroom to sing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer to all the kids. You know, so I was in show business. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I used to... We had, we had a lot of family parties as well. My mother was one of five children, four of whom played the piano very well. And they were always, we were always having parties. Um, and my nanny was, uh, was sort of the, the matriarch, the family matriarch. She, she was always organising parties. And it was expected that the cousins, of which I was the youngest but one, would uh, perform. And so my mum used to rehearse something for me to do. And uh, so performing was something that uh, right. I was used to. Yeah. And then when I was about eight, I was going to... My, my uncle George was having a party. And my mother said, right, we'll, we'll rehearse something. And I said, no, I'm going to tell some jokes. And I told some jokes and got laughs. Wow. <laughs> So then it was like, what prompted you to, to get into, like, the, was it semi-pro? You know, were you, were you doing the, the gigs while you were still at the, at the tax? Yeah, well, uh, well, before that, I mean, when I was at St Phillips Grammar School, um, I used to go round the, the parks, the Birmingham parks, used to put up big marquees during the summer, and they used to have talent competitions, and uh, I used to go and enter the talent competitions, doing mm. impressions, comedy impressions and, and singing impressions. Uh, and if you won, you got uh, 10 bob, which was four half-crown uh, saving stamps on a card. <laughs> and if you came second, you got, you got five bob. And if you came third, you got half a crown, you know. Yeah. And I used, to, I used to do several of the parks. I always used to go to Cannon Hill, which was yeah. not very far from where I lived. And the, but I'd go to various other places and, and see if I could win, you know. Right. Now, so your first... Your first big break then, holiday camps. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Well, I, I I left the Inland Revenue and literally ran away to holiday camps. Other people run away to sea. I ran away to holiday camps, and I got a job working for Warners right. on the Isle of Sheppey on the entertainment staff. 
Uh, and that really gave me a taste because I, I was there for sort of 18, 19 weeks, something like that. And I was entertaining all the while and uh, very easy because the audiences get to know you. Mm. And they, mm. instead of being sort of a performer, it's almost as though you're, you're everybody's favourite nephew, you know what I mean? Yeah, so they, yeah. they're going to encourage you, they're going to laugh at you, whether you're good or bad. Uh, of course, that, that's not the same when you try and work in the working men's clubs, as yeah, you know all about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then I, I, I came home and I used, to, I used to work the working men's clubs, not, not particularly successfully, uh, but, uh, but I, it, was a, it was a great place to, to hone your skill, you know, to get used to what was going on. Yeah. And of yeah. course, uh, to, to uh, combat hecklers as well, because there were a lot of people it's not as bad as nowadays in the comedy clubs where people go specifically and, and become known as professional hecklers <laughs> almost. Yeah. Uh, but there were people who would heckle you and you, you had to try and put them down, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it must be good to then all of a sudden be picked up by Billy Cotton. Uh, yeah, that, that really was good. I, I, did a, I did a couple of summer seasons and uh, um, after one summer season in, in a place called Felixstowe, which, so it wasn't a, wasn't a big summer season, um, I got some very nice write-ups in, in newspapers and um, a man by the name of Maurice Azer, who was a, a well-known London agent, just came down to see me and, and said that he would sign me. And he was, uh, he was Roy Hudd a Hudd's agent. Right. He had uh, people like Roy Hudd, Anita Harris, and Billy Dainter. They were his, uh, they were his top names. And then he, he signed me. And within um, a very short time, he, he, he got me to do various things in London, one nights in London. And he got television people to come along and see me. And the producer of the Billy Cotton Band Show came along. And, uh, and he picked me up and, and put this 1967 and put me into the Billy Cotton Band Show. And yeah. it was live. I got six minutes to do live on Saturday night <laughs> with about 18 million <laughs> viewers, you know. <laughs> uh, but the, the, we were in this studio and the audience were, were all there. But the Billy Cotton Band, so there's about 20 blokes behind me. And obviously they'd probably been primed, but I walked on, I was quite nervous. And I did the first gag and the whole of the band just fell about laughing. <laughs> and they then fell about at every, at every other joke. Yeah. And obviously then the audience got the idea, yeah, you know. Yeah. And um, it was quite, it was fabulous. And at the end of the show, Billy Cotton, the live show, he walked forward and he said, now you've seen that Don McLean eh, on, and he said, and when that boy is a star, you can say you saw him first on the Billy Cotton Band show. <laughs> you know, I thought well, I'm, I'm away here, <laughs> and then um, I was I was then told that Billy Cotton wanted me to be. They were doing a series the following year, the Billy Cotton Band show, and he wanted me on every single program, and uh, there was no contract signed or anything. Uh, but it wouldn't have mattered anyway because he died. In between, <laughs> in between oh, no. that series and the next series, so I, 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 what I thought was going to be this great break that was going to make me a star yeah. never happened. <laughs> <laughs> but then you got picked up. Was it by Engelbert Humperdinck's? Was it? Um, you, you did a show with him. Uh, well, no, I, t I tell you how that came about. I did in 1970. Um, I, I, I was asked to go to um, the North Pier in Blackpool, and top of the bill was the Baron Knights. Uh, yeah, and. Um, Second on the bill was Peter Gordino and his dancers. And there was me and there's a, a wonderful comedian, much older than me, called Joe Church, who I learned a tremendous amount from. Uh, anyway, there was a bloke called Ronald Bryden, who was the serious drama critic of The Observer. And he was doing a series on peers. So every Sunday there was a thing, a full page about peers in, in the, the Sunday Observer. Because at those times, the peers were massive, weren't they? Yeah, yeah there the were peers every, and everywhere, and every peer had got a theatre. Anyway, um, this, this one week, I, I didn't even know he'd been in, but he'd obviously been into the North Pier, and he did this, the whole, the whole of the article was about me. And it said, um, uh, on comes this, uh, this brash young comedian who machine guns the audience <laughs> with jokes. <laughs> and he went on about the way, the way I stood and everything. It was, it was fantastic. Next thing I know, Delphons, who put it on, all the people from Delphons are in the audience watching me. Yeah. And then they decided, first thing they did, they moved my spot. So instead of being early in the first half, my, my main spot was in the second half, immediately preceding the Baron Knights. And then two weeks before the season ended, they took me out of the, um, of the, the show on the North Pier and put me into the London Palladium with Engelbert Humperdinck. Right, right. Mm. yeah, I, I worked with Engelbert once. Yeah, well, I, yeah. 
Jerry Dorsey, oh, Arnold his name was, wasn't it? <laughs> Arnold Dorsey, no wonder he changed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Black and White Minstrels. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was a fantastic show, wasn't it? Well, it was arguably the most successful light entertainment um, show that the BBC ever created. Yeah. Uh, it, it won the Golden Rose of Montreux, not once, but twice, and that was mm. the highest award for a television programme in the whole of Europe. Um, but now the BBC uh, are so ashamed of it and mm. disgusted with themselves for ever <laughs> putting it on. Yeah, well, we, we won't dwell on that then. Now, <laughs> Cracker Jack. Yeah. Oh. Where do we even start with that? Well, what a programme. Uh, yeah. It started in 1955, when I was at school in 1955 when it started. Uh, and uh, by, by about 1959, they'd really got it right. They got the format right. Uh, Leslie Crowther was in it with uh, Little Fat Glaze. Yeah. And um, it, it had just got everything. It was uh, just the perfect children's programme. Interestingly, it was made not by children's television, but by light entertainment. And I think that was the secret. So basically, we were treating uh, children as small adults and we were making a programme with and adults comedy. adults small children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with, we were making um, a programme uh, and the humour hopefully was understood by children. It was what they wanted to laugh at, but we never, we never worked down to them. But I mean, it was a it was a huge program, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, we got eight and a half million um, viewers on a on a Friday night. Um, the the miners' strike happened while I was doing Cracker Jack, and you may remember that uh, we had the four day week. Mm. Uh, nobody mm. worked on a Friday, mm. and there was a, a wonderful thing in one of the national newspapers, a wonderful article, and it said the only good thing about the four day week is that now everybody's at home to watch McLean and Gray's <laughs> on on Cracker Jack. I kept that right up for years. I was ever so proud of that. You went into the religious um, Sunday morning show, didn't you? Oh, that was much later. That was 1990. I mean, my, my, my era was the 70s. I was on television all the while in the 70s and, and maybe the early 80s, and then it sort of waned. And I'm, I'm not... I don't worry about that. I mean, everybody has their turn. I had my turn, yeah. then it's somebody else's turn, you know, yeah. and I accept that. Uh, but in 1990, quite out of the blue, um, the BBC, BBC Radio 2, were looking for somebody to take over a programme called Good Morning Sunday that had always been presented by a minister of religion in the past. Um, and uh, they just happened to see me on a late night programme the, called the James Wales Show that, that was being done by um, a very bizarre program, being done by Yorkshire Television. I remember and the, it. the yeah. subject under discussion that particular week was religion. Right. And, and I was on it together with um, a Methodist minister and a bloke, uh, it was an Englishman who'd converted to Islam and, and uh, the programme got, uh, well, it, <laughs> it got very interesting, uh, but I, I held my own and did a few gags, you know. Yes, yeah. And um, the, the producers of, of uh, Good Morning Sunday were actually watching the programme and they said to themselves, oh, hang on, we've got... We've got somebody here who's obviously uh, a practicing Christian, goes to church every week, uh, but tells jokes for a living. They gave me the program for two weeks, uh, you know, and, and I, I thought, I've got to be honest and say, um, without any modesty at all, I thought I was quite bad. <laughs> and at the end of the two weeks, they said, right, you've, you've got the program. Right. You'll keep doing it till you get it right. <laughs> and in 2006, I got it right and they gave me the sack. <laughs> <laughs> But I did, it for, I did it for over 15 years, and I loved it. I, yeah. I, I absolutely... Because, I mean, you, you obviously enjoy interviewing. Yeah. And that yeah. was the highlight of my life. I, I, interviewed, yeah. I interviewed so many people who were, you know, people who... I mean, I, I, as I say, I, I kissed every one of the Beverly sisters. I, <laughs> I held Jonathan Edwards' gold, gold yeah. medal, and, I, and I, I was clutched to Dolly Parton's bosom. Oh, my goodness. It's got to be the best, the yeah. best job on radio. <laughs> I worked with the Beverly sisters once. Oh, they were Never oh, to wonderful. be forgotten. Oh, wonderful. Six Royal Variety Shows. Yeah, but, but um, they were Royal Variety Shows, but not, not, not one of them at the London Palladium. So, oh, right. I, you know, so did, did don't you, get did too she excited. Turn up? Did um, no, it was usually Princess Anne who turned up, you know. Uh, and, and when in the lineup, she, she twice said to me, Oh, it's you again. <laughs> 
she's a wonderful woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and you got a you got a silver heart, didn't you? For yeah, that was wonderful. Uh, that was I think I that was when I'd done thirty years in show business, and yeah. they they really made a fuss of me. We did it at um, at the NEC in Birmingham, the, the one of the hotels in there, and they'd got um, several hundred people, and then there were um, lots of my fellow comedians like. Malcolm Stent, like Jasper Carrot, who yeah. who came along and um, and did a sort of a roast on me, and <laughs> Helen Shapiro turned up as right. well. You know, um, that, so that was that was that was quite an honour. That was. But you did get the MBE. Ah, yeah, that was two thousand and one in the two thousand and one honours list, and it was given to me by for services to religion and interfaith relations, which was nice. And Not for comedian. No, no, it was it was obviously for the for the program, you know, yeah. for Good Morning Sunday, yeah. uh, which was um, we were getting two and a half million listeners on a Sunday morning. Uh, mm. We were we were doing really well. It was really well thought of. BBC. I was known in the BBC as Dangerous Don because <laughs> they never knew what I was going to say next. <laughs> but that was why people listened. Yeah. And talking about people listening, uh, Her Majesty shook hands with me and she she looked at me. And she said, "I was listening to your program on Sunday." <laughs> <laughs> and she must have been, because, I mean, the, the, the Queen wouldn't tell a lie, would no, she? You know? No, fantastic. And then you got the papal knighthood as ah, well. Ah, yeah, well, that, that is the thing that I am, I am most proud of in my entire life. That was uh, 2012, um, and it was Pope Benedict who... Uh, I suddenly got a telephone call from Bernard Longley, the Archbishop of Birmingham, who said, I'm delighted to tell you, he said that... Um, uh, His Holiness has decided that you are to be made a, a Knight of St Sylvester. Wow. Came, it came quite out of the blue, although, funnily enough, I knew I was being investigated. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you get investigated, but, yeah. uh, and, and people were, uh, like my daughter and uh, various other people that I knew, had been asked to, to find out certain things about me without me knowing. You a bit know. like This Is Your Life. I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> Although, that, that's, they're, they're very clever on This Is Your Life. They don't let anything go, do they? Uh, but... Um, uh, I thought maybe it was a there's, there's a, a thing called a benemerente, which literally means well done, and it's a medal that the mm. uh, the the the, uh, the Pope or the Vatican give out to certain people, but obviously not nearly so grand as a, as a papal knighthood. Mm. And uh, I was delighted to have been made uh, a knight of uh, Saint Sylvester, uh, and I've got a uniform and a sword and a funny hat, <laughs> and um, and I'm I have entitlements like I can I can ride my horse into Saint Peter's Basilica oh, in right. Rome. Bit like being a free man of London, you can drive your sheep across the across the Bridge. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I often think that if I did try and ride a horse, I'd obviously be uh, shot by um, a Swiss Guard sniper, <laughs> wouldn't I? You know. <laughs> now let's do a little bit of a swerver here. Squash. I didn't know that you're big into squash, aren't you? Well, I started playing squash. Um, in about 1970, when I was on that summer season on the North Pier in Blackpool, and um, I, I really got into it. It was uh, I became what's known as a squonky, which is a squash junkie, right. you know. And I played sort of every day, and I used to train every day. And uh, and then um, we, I, they then had a showbiz squash team, and the members of the showbiz squash team were um, Tommy Steele, m myself, um, uh, Leonard Rossiter. You know, Rigsby. Really, yes. Um, James Hunt, the racing driver, right. and then William Frank Franklin, who you may remember yeah. did the the Shreps. Shreps advert. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and we were the five players, and we were we were good enough to take on a team at, at a squash club, and we all, all the money we raised was um, for the Malcolm Sargent Fund for Cancer in Children. So, and we went we went all over the country. Right. We had a fabulous time. Yeah. Used to used to play the games. I used to do. I used to do like a comedy game. I just used to keep coming out the court and talking to the referee <laughs> and the umpire and, and the audience and, you know, get, make people laugh. You mentioned Malcolm Stent before. Yeah. I know you're still involved with him as well, aren't you? Yeah, he's, he's, he's really a, my best mate, really, I suppose, and we've done a tremendous amount over the years together. Malcolm's a, a good writer and he wrote Go and Play Up Your Own End, mm. in which uh, I, I, he got me uh, to, to do a part in it and that was very successful. Then he wrote Go and Play Further, and uh, I was in that as well. And then A League Apart, which was about uh, Aston Villa and Birmingham City. Which, uh, and then uh, he, he said to me recently, well, um, 
couple of years ago, he said, we need, we, why don't we write something about the First World War? He said, because the centenaries are all coming up. He said, we can write a, a play. He said, and it'll last for four years. <laughs> <laughs> right, I said. Uh, and we, we, I did all the research, because I'm um, a bit of a, a buff on the First World War. It's been an interest of mine since I was a teenager. And we, uh, we read a play called The Brummage and Pals, because you yeah. know about the Pals Battalions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the premise is, I'm, I'm an old fella, uh, who's been in the First World War, and I'm in a I'm in a, a Commonwealth War Grave cemetery in France, and and I start relating about things that happened in the war, and then that comes to life on stage by by the other people on stage. Right. Uh, the, in other words, we're in two different time frames. I'm in the not the present day because otherwise I'd be about 140, but I'm in the modern times, and they are in the uh, period from 1914 to 1918 yeah. and it's been incredibly well received so much so that we're taking it on on tour again in in October and I think it's 24th and 25th we're at uh, the Grand Wolverhampton doing three shows and on the 26th we're at uh, Redditch at the Palace Redditch right. uh, but apart from that all the other all the other dates that we're doing are not not in the Midlands right. so right. I won't try and persuade our viewers to come <laughs> Don, it's been fantastic to talk to you. It's been great to talk to you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs>